Well, welcome everybody, and I want to say hello to our Femic Island campus. We love you guys. So glad that you're with us today. Let's give Femic Island a big hand. Thank you guys for being with us today. Thank you so much for being a part of this weekend service and our Rehoboth campus and online. Those of you that are listening online, so thank you, so thankful for you listening. We're in a series. We've been uh, talking this summer about 1 Corinthians, and this series is called Crazy Church People, and we're looking at the crazy things that happen in the book of 1 Corinthians. Important thing to remember about this book is these are new Christians, about a year and a half old in the Lord. They don't know anything about Jesus, know nothing about the Old Testament. They don't know anything about how to live the Christian life. And they're in this secular city, sort of like Las Vegas. It's a crazy, crazy, wild city. And they have all these questions. And much of 1 Corinthians is them asking questions. And they ask questions and Paul answers them. So they got all of these issues. So uh, today we come to chapter 11 of, uh, of 1 Corinthians. And this is the hardest, most difficult passage in the book of 1 Corinthians. It's the hardest one to understand it's the hardest one to comprehend. It's the hardest one in 1 Corinthians. Maybe the hardest one in the whole New Testament. This is a tough, tough passage. And uh, so being the man that I am, I didn't duck this. I'm coming right into it. We're going to look at some really important things today. And if I can get through this text today alive, it's going to be amazing. Because this has really got some tricky things in it. There's a lot of trip wires, a lot of landmines in this text. So hopefully we're going to get through it okay. But I want to read it to you first of all. And then we'll talk a little bit about it. And uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 2 through 16, uh, he says, I praise you for remembering me in everything and for holding to the teaches, teachings just as I pass them on to you. Now I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ, the head of the woman is man, the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head, and everyone who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It is just as though her head were shaved. If a woman does not cover her head, she should have her hair cut off, and if it's a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut off or shaved, she should cover her head. A man ought not to cover his head since he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. For man did not come from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created from woman, but man, woman from man. For this reason, and because the angels, the woman ought to have a sign of authority on her head." In the Lord, however, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as woman came from man, so also man is born of woman. But everything comes from God. Judge for yourself, is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him? But if that a woman has long hair, it is her glory. For long hair is given to her as a covering. If any wants to be con anyone wants to be contentious about this, we have no other practice, nor do the churches of God. Now, when I was in high school, this text, uh, chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians, was a really important part of the Bible for me because my dad and I had these debates about long hair. I was, uh, I was raised in the... Uh, uh, went to high school in the 70s, so long hair was in. Does anybody remember long hair? When long hair, like, that was the thing. You know, bell bottoms, does anybody remember bell bottoms? You know, you used to drag them in the dirt, you know, that was, uh, you know. So my dad and I had a lot of debates about how long your hair should be. And this text says that it's a disgrace for a man to have long hair. So anyhow, there's this, like, uh, this, this emotional attachment to this text in my adolescence because of all the debates I had with my dad. I wanted to have long hair, but my dad believed in being saved and shaved. That was my dad. He wanted me to be shaved and saved. So anyhow, we had these debates about how long your hair could be. But this is a very complicated text and the reason it's complicated is because there is a great divide between the cultures, the world that they live in. We don't know exactly all that's going on in this story here in this part of 1 Corinthians, but there are some issues. And it's sort of like when you read this text, it's sort of like listening to somebody talking on a cell phone. You just hear their side of the conversation. And the other day, Karen was talking to somebody on the phone, and I was listening, and uh, I was trying to figure out who she was talking to, and I was getting bits and pieces of the story of what she was saying, but I didn't get the full story. And so when you read 1 Corinthians 11, because we don't live in Corinth, because we don't live in 60 AD, there are some things that are happening with women and men in the church that we don't quite 
understand. So there's a little bit of a cultural divide here, and we're trying to figure this out. And so we're not able to connect all the dots, and we're not hearing it really, really well. We don't quite understand what's going on. So we're going to get some general principles out of this. Uh, Now, I have trouble... Uh, hearing a little bit. I don't have great hearing. Uh, I wear hearing aids, and I, I don't wear them because they work that well. I just like the way, the way they look. That's the reason I wear them. And uh, so I, I wear these hearing aids because I just, don't, I just like the way they look. But anyhow, uh, consequently, I lost some of my hearing back in, when I'm in my 40s, and I went to Johns Hopkins University, and I don't know what's wrong with my hearing, but I don't hear really, really well sometimes. And so consequently, I hear things that aren't being said. I, I hear things, think people say things that, that uh, you know, they, they say something that's absolutely clear, but I hear something completely different. So like the other day, for instance, Karen uh, mentioned uh, uh, Pat and Alice Porus, uh, and, and Pat and Alice serve in our church, and uh, Alice and Pat are a wonderful part of our church, and she said to me, uh, Pat and Alice are going to Turkey, and that's what she said, they're going to visit Turkey on a trip, they're going to visit Turkey. What I heard was, uh, Pat put a hat, or Alice put a hat on a turkey, that's what I heard. And I said, you, you, Alice put a hat on a turkey? Uh, that's what I heard. Uh, and so when you read this text, you kind of get that kind of feeling, and you don't quite, quite get it. So there are some principles here that are important, and we're, gonna, we're not going to be able to explain everything, but we're going to be able to look at certain things in the text. The first thing that's real important, this part of 1 Corinthians is about church services. Uh, chapter 11 through chapter 14 is about the Corinthians meeting together as a church. Now, before this, they've been dealing with all these lawsuit issues and issues in their, in, their, in their daily lives and sexuality and all that. But for four chapters in the book, we get this idea that Paul is helping them to show them how do they do church services? How do they have church together? So this is important because what it says to me is, is that evidently in the early church, Meeting together as Christ followers or people that love Jesus was an important component of what they did in their journey in the Christian life. So there was four chapters spent on that. So it tells me that meeting together, coming together as followers of Jesus is a big deal because Paul took a big chunk of 1 Corinthians and talked about when you get together and you worship Jesus and you're studying about the Lord and you're growing in your faith, here's how you should do it. So here's an important principle for us to remember. It's very important that we remember that gathering together in a community of faith was important to Paul, and it should be important to us. Because it was important to Paul, he took so much time, so much space. When you see something in Scripture that has a lot of space devoted to it, that means it's very important. So meeting together as believers is very, very important. That's an important thing. You guys being here today, you you got ready this morning. Did anybody want to sleep in this morning? Just raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. I don't want to see it. I don't want to know it. I'm just if you did you think about you wanted to stay in bed this morning? Some of you like maybe I won't go today. And sometimes when it rains and sometimes when it's, it's either if it's raining, sometimes people don't go. If it's really nice, sometimes people don't, know, don't go. So we just pray for like a medium day every weekend on, on Sunday. It's not too good. It's not too bad. But, you know, coming to church and being a part of Christian community was something that Paul spent time teaching on. Now, in, uh, so it really does matter if we gather together, so there was a big section in this passage about, uh, about Christians gathering together. Now, I, the other day, I sent this email to this girl. Uh, her name was Charlie White. Charlie was sang on our stage for a lot, a lot of years, and uh, Charlie got married. She married Daniel Wilson up in Edgewater, Maryland. I talked about it a few weeks ago, and uh, I, uh, I sent uh, Charlie a note. I said, can I talk about your wedding in the, in the, in the sermon? And I had, it was going to be a sermon illustration. And she wrote me back and said I could and all that. So a few weeks ago, I talked about Charlie White's wedding. And Charlie got married to Daniel Wilson. Beautiful wedding. But when she wrote me back, they moved to Utah after they got married. In fact, after I pronounced them husband and wife, they got, we were, they got married on a pier in the Chesapeake Bay. And when I said, I pronounce you husband and wife, they jumped in a boat and went off in the bay. It was beautiful. I'd never seen anything like it before. Um, and, uh, but anyhow, after their wedding, they moved to Utah. And I said to uh, 
Charlie, I said, Charlie, you mind if I tell the story about you and Daniel getting married? And I told her how I was going to use the story. And she wrote me back, absolutely, Danny, Pastor Danny, no problem. By the way, we're in Utah. Our careers are going good. We're getting used to our new life. And we have found a new church. And here's what she said, we're putting roots down. We found a new church and we're putting roots down. Now, do you know what I really... Uh, you know, I, I could be flattered if Charlie and, and Daniel uh, go to Utah and they're just watching Bayshore online. It's okay to have online services. There's no problem with that at all. But, you know, my highest uh, compliment that I had to Charlie was that when they went to that new community, they found a Christian gathering of people that they connected with because that is how their Christian faith will develop. And I was so proud of them. So say this with me. If Paul spent a lot of time talking about believers being together, it must be important. So when you get to 1 Corinthians 11, it's about how do they operate in the church. And for four chapters, he's going to talk about how to do church. So it matters. I love to go to church. I love to be with you guys. I couldn't wait to see you guys this morning. I couldn't wait to listen to, to, uh, to, to Jeremy lead worship this morning. I just love to be with God's people. And it's an important part of our journey. I was preaching here one Sunday, and I was preaching through the, through the book of Acts. And I got to chapter 16, and I talked about Lydia that was converted. Uh, Lydia got converted. She was by this, uh, the, the river there in uh, Philippi, and she got converted. And she, it said she, she and her family persuaded Paul to come and stay with her. And I was preaching on that text, and I thought to myself, why did Lydia, why did she want, after she got saved, and it says after she got saved, she believed what Paul said, she was baptized. After she got saved, after she believed, after she was baptized, she persuaded Paul to let Paul, to Paul and Silas to come stay with her. And why did she do that? Because she had all of these questions about the faith. And she was very interested in growing her faith. And I said in that service, I said that if you are truly converted, if you're truly born of the Spirit, if you truly have a relationship with Jesus, you're going to have an innate spiritual hunger for spiritual things, and you are going to want to gather together with God's people. Now, when I said that, there was a guy visiting that Sunday that was uh, here for a baby dedication, and uh, he heard that, and uh, he called me, made an appointment to meet with me, and I shared this in my book, my last book, and uh, he was uh, a little bit upset, and he said, you know what, he said, uh, you know, here's how I do my Christian life. He said, he said uh, you know, I don't go to church all the time, but every once in a while, I just get a hankering. I get like a, I get like a drawing that I want to go to church to hear this certain pastor. And said, I'll go and I'll hear that pastor and I'll hear something. And then I'll just like take that in and I won't, you know, go for maybe another three months. And then I'll get a leading again and then I'll go visit another pastor. And, and he said, when you said that, I just was, I didn't, I just, that really bothered me that you said that true Christianity and authentic conversion will many times correspond, I think I didn't say many times, I said it will correspond with a desire and a hunger for, for fellowship and to grow in your faith. And so he's like, just kind of like telling me that and just a little intense about it. And, you know, he didn't disagree with what I said. And so this pastoral spirit came on me and I'm just loving and I'm kind and I'm listening to him. And I just followed along with him. And then I finally said, when he wanted me to respond, I said, well, listen, uh, I'm sorry you disagree with me. But I said, the type of Christianity that you're describing of every once in a while going to church is nowhere remotely revealed in the New Testament. In the New Testament, when people found Jesus, they gathered with other believers. They got together and they worshiped Jesus. They grew in their faith. And uh, I have a wonderful letter from the uh, 113 AD from Pliny the Younger. He's try describing these Christians. He's writing Trajan the emperor. And this is like 80 years after Jesus was raised from the dead. And Pliny the Younger says, I don't know what to do with these Christians. He said, they get together early in the morning and they worship Jesus as a God. They read scripture scripture and they sing hymns and then they come back that night for a meal and they have a meal together did you realize on the, the early church they met on sunday sunday was a work day so they met before work they got up early before they went to work they, they worshiped jesus in the fields they worshiped jesus in the in the alleys of the cities and they read scripture and they made it says plenty of the younger says they make confessions that they won't commit fraud they won't commit stealing that they'll be honest and they'll be upright citizens in the empire and he says, I don't know what to do with these Christians. So Christians have always gathered together. So in this 
text you see this, that, that going to church is a normal thing. Hebrews 10, uh, 24, um, don't be in the habit of not drawing together as some are in the habit of not coming to church and all that. So anyhow, so listen, if you are uh, online listening, that's a wonderful, incredible part of our journey. Some people are in a place of, of COVID concern right now. So that's absolutely okay. We honor you. But we know the, the, the model, the model, the important model that we need to get back to as we get through all this stuff is for people to gather together as believers. And if you're glad you're with other people that love Jesus like you today, you do today, would you say a big amen right now? Amen. amen. That's good. So that's the first thing in the passage. That's just a general overview. Then the second thing we see in the passage is that the early church was co-ed in ministry, was co-ed in ministry. We find that there, in fact, Paul says this. He says, uh, it says, everyone who prays or prophesies with his head uncovered. It says, uh, dishonors it. And everyone who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head as, just as, as, a, as, a, as if her head were shaped. So what I'm getting at here is we see in the text that men in the church prayed and prophesied. And women in the church prayed and prophesied. So we don't want to, uh, he doesn't say, we want the women to quit praying and prophesying in the church. It's just supposed to be the men that are praying and prophesying in the church. In the the early church, we see a co-ed ministry approach. We see men and women in this text, that are praying and prophesying in the church. So women played an incredible role in the early church. Now, that's important. The reason it's important is this was a wild paradigm shift in the ancient world. It was a wild paradigm shift in the ancient world. When I was going to the University of Delaware, this, uh, my, one of my favorite English professors, literature professor, wonderful, sharp lady, she said, you know, she knew I was a Christ follower, and she said, you know, I respect you and all that, but said, I just have trouble with the Bible because Paul and Jesus were, were just so anti-women. That is not at all the case. Not at all the case. We had a little conversation about that, uh, but it's, uh, it's just not the case because here's what, let me give you a couple of little crazy things that they believed in the ancient world, and, uh, and, this, and you're not going to like this. This is not what I believe. This is what they said in the ancient world about women. Uh, listen to this. Josephus, the Jewish historian, said, a woman, the woman is inferior to man in every way. That was what Josephus said. The Talmud says, a hundred women are no better than two men. A man, this is, a man is required to say the following three things in his blessing every day. Blessed are you who have not made me a heathen, who have not made me a woman, who have not made me a literate. And then finally, this is just another one. There's a whole bunch of them. Uh, the, one of the Talmuds says, uh, it is better that the words of the law should be burned than that they should be taught to a woman. So that was the world that Paul lived in that Jesus lived in, and here's what we see as we read this text. We see women that are prophesying and praying in the church and that they play a major role in the church. And we have this uh, incredible insight that there is this shift that God is restoring to the church through the Apostle Paul, both genders involved in ministry and lifting up Jesus and having a part of the worship service. Now, a lot of Sundays when we have worship here, now today it just happened to be we just had men on the stage, but a lot of Sundays, Hartley's up here or, or, uh, uh, you know, or or different women that are part of our worship team here. Uh, uh, We have in in our Femic Island campus, we have Brigida Canfield, listen to me right now, and Joel, and many times Joel leads worship, many times Brigida on the stage comes out and leads worship, the songs, and in our church we have like ladies like Beverly LaPeck, a wonderful uh, woman that mentors other women in our church. We have Jody Monroe who was up here last Last week, given the announcements, and we have all of these women that are a part of the church. God's kingdom is about both genders being involved in ministry. And in this text, we see that, that both women and men are involved in the ministry of the church. And so Paul says, uh, you know, women and men are part praying and prophesying. And he's not saying in the text, we need to keep these women quiet in the church. 
And he's not saying that. He's saying he's having something to do about head coverings, what we're going to get to in a minute, which is going to be an interesting part of the, of the text there. So would you say this with me so we understand the text? Here's what the text says. Would you just say this with me? God has ordained that men and women serve Jesus together in the church. So how many men are here today? Raise your hand. You're a man. You're a man. Raise your hand. How many women are here today? Raise your hand. We got men and women. On our staff, we have men and women. God has ordained that men and women would serve together, a very important part of, of the church. And uh, so that's an important, important thing. Now, the reason we know it's important is, is this, is Jesus had women elevated in his ministry. So Paul... Paul, in the same way, had women highly involved in ministry in his, in his, his church, in his ministry as well. Just a couple of things. By the way, here's an interesting thing. Do you realize in the ancient world, in the world that Jesus lived in, in the ancient world, a woman, her testimony in court was inadmissible. Even if Josephus says, even if there were multiple women that witnessed something, it would not bear any weight in court. But when Jesus is raised from the dead on Easter and he is resurrected from the dead and are you grateful that Jesus has been raised from the dead and we're worshiping him today as followers of Jesus, would you say a big amen? amen? Jesus has been raised from the dead and the first people that, that are witnesses of his resurrection, the gospel Luke says, is Mary Magdalene and Joanna and the, another Mary about four different women are the witnesses of the resurrection. They saw Jesus. It's like the Father is, is rectifying things that for so many years women have been oppressed and put down. And so we're going to raise up women as the privilege, the privilege of being the witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so Mary Magdalene was the first person and the different women that saw Jesus. And so that tells us another thing. It tells us that the story was not made up. It was not fabricated. And if you're going to make up a story about the resurrection of Jesus, you wouldn't have women be the witnesses of it. But God, in his economy, chose these women to be witnesses of the resurrection. So that is an important thing. So let me just give you a couple little things. I've got a whole bunch of scriptures that we don't have time to read. Um, it says, uh, look at, uh, let me get, read to you Luke 8, 1 through 3. After this, Jesus traveled from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The 12 were with him. And also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Now, we don't know, and tradition has said Mary Magdalene was a loose woman. She was like a prostitute. We don't know that that's, it just says seven demons were cast up from her. But she was from Magdala, which was a place that had a lot of prostitutes. So she could have had a really, really rough background. And then it says Joanna, the wife of Cusa, the manager of Herod's household. So this is a woman, a white-collar woman, who is well-established in society. Joanna, the wife of Cusa, the manager of Herod's household. So we have an upper-class woman. And then we have uh, and Susanna and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. And we have lots of others. So let me read you one more verse where it says, this is Paul. Paul mentions in Philippians chapter 4, verses 2 through 3, plead with Yodia, plead with Syndicate to agree with each other in the Lord. Yes, I ask you, loyal yoke fellow, help these women. Help these women. They were having an argument. Yoda and Syndicate, which I love that. They were having arguments in the early church. People didn't get along sometimes. And by the way, has anybody here ever, ever, since you become a Christian, not got along with somebody? Just raise your hand if that's ever happened to you. Or you know somebody. Just raise your hand if you know somebody. Okay? Plead with Yoda and Syndicate to agree with each other in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, loyal yoke fellow, help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel. Who have contended at my side in the gospel. So what we see here is we see that we see that these women are contending at Paul's side. They're beside him. They're not under him. They're beside him. They've contended at his side. They're serving him. And that reminds me, it reminds us when 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 uh when Eve was created, when Eve was created, uh it says she was uh out of Adam's uh rib, God took a rib 
and made Eve. And really the word in the Hebrew for rib is side. Took, at, took out of Adam's side a woman and made him to stand beside him. And she became his helpmeet or his ally. His ally. It's a, the word helpmeet is an ally in, in the Hebrew. So Jesus uh, is, is carrying on this tradition that women are to be, in the, and Paul carrying on the tradition that women are to be beside serving in ministry. So we see in this text, we see in 1 Corinthians that women and men are serving together. So that's that. That's good. Now we do have, uh, this is where one of the tripwires is. So we do have, notice that, well, how far does that mean? Women, women can pray and prophesy and they can do stuff that men can do. We do have in the New Testament, if we're honest about what it says in the New Testament, there are no such thing as, as female elders. And according to 1 Timothy, that uh, the husband of one wife and it goes, all the pronouns are he, he, he. And you say, well, why is that? Well, I don't know why it is. And it's really, uh, you know, I think that people have different roles. When you have a different role, it does not mean inequality. A different role does not mean inequality. A different role is just a different role. And so we don't see that there are any uh, female elders. And when Jesus chose the 12 apostles, he prayed on the mountain all night long. And then he chose the 12 and he ordained them and all of them were male. So apostles and elders in the New Testament were primarily male. And that is not... That is not uh, masochistic. That is just the order of how things seem to be. Now, there are many, many people that disagree with that. And so I would never roll on my sleeves and fight about that. But that's where I'm at, and that's what it seems to say to me there. And so that's interesting for me. So uh, I'm, I'm a for whoever God wants to bless. I'm for whoever, you know, if God wants you to ordain cats, I'm all about it. Let's just do it, you know. But let's just be, uh, I want to be faithful to Scripture. So one of the arguments is like, um, Hey, that Jesus didn't want to upset the apple cart too much, and so that's why he ordained, he ordained uh, just men. And so he was compl- complying with culture a little bit because he didn't want to upset the apple cart too much. Sort of like Marty McFly in Back to the Future when he's playing the Chuck Berry song and the people are shocked. He said, you are not ready for this, uh, but your kids are going to love it, that kind of thing. How many remember that scene in the movie? Is that what Jesus is doing? Well, it didn't seem like to me that Jesus had a lot of trouble upsetting the apple cart. Anyhow, so I'm not sure that, that was it. But anyhow, that's, that's where we are. So just say this with me before we move to the next point. And I'm anxious to get to the next point. So here we go. We'll get to the next point in just a minute. Say this with me. Say this with me. God has ordained that in the church, men and women serve Jesus together. And ladies, we are so thankful for you would you would all the men today just give a big applause for the the ladies in our church love our ladies and appreciate our women in our church so uh anyhow just one more thing just while i'm right into it let me just say one more thing you know uh, you know what i think you know when it says that uh, it says that adam that that uh eve came out of his side she didn't come out of his one of his uh, bones of his feet but came out of his side. There's two extremes. The Archie Bunker extreme, uh, All in the Family. How many remember that show, All in the Family? Archie Bunker, the masochistic. Edith is just like a little child in the family. She's a moron. She doesn't know anything. That is just, how many know that that model, you know, that is not God. That is, if you think that's biblical, Ephesians 5, you're full of baloney. That's not it at all. That model is totally wrong. But let me tell you something. Everybody Loves Raymond is a bad model as well. And I love Everybody Loves Raymond. How many watch Everybody Loves Raymond? I love that show. Patricia Heaton playing Deborah. Uh, Patricia Heaton is a Christian, by the way, and she goes to Matthew Barnett's church. And uh, Patricia Heaton, wonderful lady. But in the show, uh, you know, Ray is an absolute moron. All he cares about is golf and watching TV, and he has no leadership. He has no wisdom and all that. That model is a wrong model just as the Archie Bunker model is wrong. And, and what the Lord wants to do is in the church, in our marriages, 
He wants to put together a model where there's a husband in the relationship, a husband in the marriage that will lay down his life for his wife. He loves his wife, and he's not thinking about, I want to be in control so I can get what I want. He's thinking, and he's collaborating with his wife. He's listening to her because she has wisdom. But when they come to a situation where they can't make a decision and something has to be done, prayerfully they go on our knees, and the husband tries to make the decision that's best for the family. That is the biblical model there. But this whole idea of Deborah being in control uh, is, is just as wrong as the Archie Bunker model. So, okay, now let's get into some more stuff here. This is really great stuff today. So let's see what else we can get into this. How many are having fun? Are you having fun up there? Are you having a good time out there? Well, I'm glad you are because I'm not having a very good time. But anyhow, we were having a good time. <clears throat> now, let me give you something else that's important for you to understand this text. This is really important. And it's the mo- one of the most uh, volatile parts of the, of, the, of the text. And it is this, verse 3. Now, I want you to realize the head of every man is Christ. And the head of the woman is man. And the head of Christ is God. So there's, there's a thing. There's a, there's, that's a little tricky there. Now, do you remember, uh, the, some of you are old enough to remember Alexand- Alexander, he- uh, Alexander Haig. Who remembers Alexander Haig? He was the was he Secretary of State during the Reagan administration. And remember when Reagan got shot, Alexander Haig showed up and he said, "Not to worry, I'm in charge." Do you remember that? Nobody. How many don't remember that? Anybody remember that? Some of you remember that. It's just like I'm in charge, and it was like, oh, we're like, ooh, it was just a little too much. And the head, this whole thing, uh, the head, every man. I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ, the head of every woman is man, the head of every Christ, uh, head of Christ is God. And here's a very important part to understand here. The word head there is kephle in the Greek. And it is most of the time translated origin. Origin. So it's not usually translated um, authority. I'm the head, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm in charge. That's not how it's usually translated. And it's just, this is probably a poor translation. That, that the head, I am in charge. What it really means is that the origin of every man is Christ, that Christ created every man. That, that, that woman was created out of man. Out of the side of man came woman. Man was the origin of woman. And then, but later on it says in the text that every man is born of woman, so every man needs a woman in order to be born. So it's talking about the inner connection of relationship between men and women, that Christ created man, he's our origin, and that we we have a common connection because we need each other. We need each other, and we are uh, designed by God uh, that, that Christ is the head of every man is Christ. Christ is my origin. It says out of Colossians and Colossians that, that through Christ, God made everything. He was, he was the agent of creation. God created everything through, through Christ. And then woman was the head of every woman is man. The head, the origin of the woman is man. Man out of his rib, out of his side came woman. So it doesn't have to do with authority has to do with origin. Anybody here ever been on the Pocomoke River? Anybody know where the Poc- anybody ever been on the Pocomoke River? The Pocomoke River, you know where the head of the Pocomoke River is? The head of the Pocomoke River is in Burnt Swamp right behind us. That's where it started. It's the origin of where it began. So, um, so all the men say this with me. Just say this with me. Say, say I am from the Lord, he is my origin. So the origin of every man is Christ. And let's just read it, replacing that word. Um, It says, now I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ. The origin of every man is Christ. The origin of the woman is man, and the origin of Christ is God. That means that God sent Jesus into the world as our Redeemer. So we, we see uh, in, in the story, in the text, we see that, that headship has to do with origin, not with authority. Headship has to do with origin, not with authority. And so we need each other. We need each other. Women and men, we need each other. All of us need Christ. He's our head. He's our origin. He's our sustainer. 
We need the Lord. How many know our country, America, needs Jesus? We need, he is our support. So that's what the text, uh, text means. One other thing, I've got 49 seconds left, so one other, one other thing that's a general observation about this text. And this is very, very important. And this is, this is, this is as, con, con, as controversial as what I've said already. And here is, here's what I think is interesting about the text. And this is, when you read 1 Corinthians and you look at this book and you uh, analyze it, something to remember is this. Who is Paul talking to? Who is Paul talking to? And in the text, we didn't even get into the long hair and all that. One of the, the prostitutes in the, in the city of Corinth, remember they have the temple of Aphrodite, the prostitutes wore short hair, and he didn't want the women in the church looking like the world, looking like the prostitutes in the temple. He wanted them to look differently. He wanted them to have long hair. And one of the things that's in the text, if you look at it, every commentator I read said this about it. One of the things that this text in 1 Corinthians 11 says is that there, is, there was an emphasis on Paul. Paul was saying that men should look like men and women should look like women. Men should look like men and women should look like women. Women should have long hair. Now, that's not, <clears throat> that doesn't mean in our culture, if you have short hair, that's, that's anything wrong with that. We're not measuring anybody's hair and all that. But bottom line is, in that culture, long hair for a woman was feminine. So ladies... It's okay, and the New Testament was saying in the church, in the church people, women should look like women. In, and in our culture, there's a big gender blur right now. And it says in the, in the scriptures in the beginning of Genesis, it says uh, God made them male and he made them female. In the book of Deuteronomy, women aren't supposed to wear men's clothes and men aren't supposed to wear women's clothes. What in God's creation, he designed that women be feminine and they look like women and that men look like men. And that's, that's part of what's in the text. But in, this, in the 1 Corinthians 11, he's talking, to, he's talking to the church. He's not talking to the town. He's not talking to the city of Corinth. He's not saying, I want you all to get uh, placard signs and I want you to go out in front of the temple of Aphrodite and I want you to protest what's going on in the temple of Aphrodite. He's monitoring the church. He's talking about the people of God. He's talking about how the church is supposed to live. Our focus is to be not to change everything around us because everything around us is the way it is because it's an unregenerate world. It's people that don't know Jesus, don't know Jesus, and expect the world to look like the world and act like the world. But we're all hung up. I get 20 emails a week about things I need to protest and say things about. And uh, I contacted my uh, representative this week. He did something I really liked. I said, you did a good job, and I appreciate that. And that's fine. But we have an inordinate amount of focus on changing the world. When 1 Corinthians teaches us that Paul is trying to change the church, and when the church be reflects the new creation, we reflect being like Jesus. We reflect what the kingdom of God is supposed to be like, how husbands and wives get along together, how women are women and men are women. When we begin to reflect the wholeness of how God designed the world, the world looks in and they have an appeal to what they see. Instead of us taking all of our energy and trying to change everything out there and getting all frustrated about what's going on out there, I'm telling you that the New Testament, what it really says is that we need to change ourselves and we need to reflect the beauty of God's holiness. And as we reflect the beauty of God's holiness, we will begin to see the world change. We've got it backwards. 50 years, 50 years. I was in college 50 years ago. We supported James Dobson and listened to Focus on the Family. James Dobson started about helping families, then went highly political, and for years and years of political. Then we got Moral Majority with Jerry Falwell, and we went billions and billions of dollars and billions and billions of dollars and, and billions of dollars of money spent and energy spent in that. Then we got Pat Robertson, 
And we've gone group after group after group after group, and we put incredibly amount of money in this. And let me tell you something, it hasn't changed the world one iota. Things are worse than they were when we started. So I'm telling you that the answer is not making them act right. The answer is for us to begin to live the model of how God made this world. Men and women living together in marriage and harmony and reflecting the image of Christ. Husbands serving wives, love, loving wives, loving their husbands, working together, seeing in the church a sense of healthy gender, seeing in the church a healthy way of living. And as the world looks into this, this new world, this new planet that's in the midst of them, that's how this world will change. And a very, very important thing, we need to become more and more attractive to the world. And just, just say this with me. Uh, God wants to change us first. So there's an, un, I'm telling you, there's an inordinate amount of energy spent on trying to get the world to act like Christians. And they're not Christians. They don't know Jesus and expect the world to act like the world. I was, uh, I was in uh, Brooks Brothers the other day. I had a pair of pants hanging in my closet that I never worn from Brooks Brothers. I, I like Brooks Brothers clothes. Um, I don't wear them a lot because I wear jeans and casual clothes in church, but when I do funerals and stuff, I like, I like Brooks Brothers. They've got good clothes and uh, so, you know, I'll save up $500 to bear, bear, buy a pair of socks when I get a chance. So it's uh, a little expensive. But uh, when I go to Brooks Brothers, I had these pants that didn't fit. You know, they had the tags on them. And so I took them back and they were like two years old, never even wore them one time and had the receipt that gave me a gift card. Man, I'm starting to buy stuff. Man, I'm having the best time. And, and I, I'm I, like, I don't, nobody has to persuade me to buy Brooks Brothers clothes because they look good and they're made good. I was in there one day and I knew I, did, I shouldn't go in there. I shouldn't go in there, but I went in there. I went in there and I'm looking around. They got suits on sale. Dag on, suits on sale. I look good in a suit. I look fine in a new suit, you know? So I'm like, I'm thinking, man, I went in there, I bought two suits, bought two suits. And then you got to have the, the shirts and then you got to have the ties. And, you, and Lord knows your socks aren't any good. You got to have socks. You see, when something is attractive and it looks good, you have no trouble putting on that thing that looks good. When the church begins to look like it's supposed to look and we get our focus off the world, trying to change the world, and we try to become the, the beauty of God's holiness, people are going to see the beauty, see the value, and they'll have no trouble putting on that which they see. Would you lift your hands to the Lord right now? The Holy Spirit is moving in our community. Holy Spirit is speaking in our community. We just thank you, Lord, for what you're doing, what you're saying to us these days. We ask you, Lord, to help us to be transformed and to be changed into the body of Christ, into becoming the people that you want us to be. We thank you for loving us and caring about us and ministering to us. We thank you, Lord, for the power of your Holy Spirit. We ask you, Lord, to work in your grace and your mercy in our midst. Just say this right now, Lord, make me, make me what you want me to be. Transform the church. Make it the beauty of the Lord. Father, change us, Lord. It's us that's the problem, Lord. It's not them, it's us. Help us to get our focus on you and become the people you want us to be. We ask you to help us. And if you're here today and you've never received the Lord, we invite you to, to invite Christ into your life today to say, Jesus, I make you Lord of my life. Lord of my life. Purify me, change me, and make me a new creation in Christ so I can reflect to this world your purpose and plan for other people. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen.